Good evening to everybody. Um, for those of you who are here last week, welcome back. How many of you were here last week? Oh, good. Okay, so a lot of you guys. Um, so last time we talked about the rapture, and so for those of you who weren't here, you can look that up online. Um, it was also talked about the end times, the tribulation, the second coming. So today we're going to continue talking about the end times, and we're going to focus on what's called the last four things. So, but before we begin, before we begin, um, let's just start off with a prayer, and, and we can say the, the glory be together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. We'll refer to him some during this. So, um, so first I want to start off. There was once a, a rich man, and he was approaching death. And so as he was getting closer and closer, he started reflecting on his life, and he just had gained so much wealth, great possessions, and he just couldn't believe that after death he couldn't take any of it with him. And so he prayed and prayed to God to let him take his something from his material possessions with him to heaven. And so one day an angel appeared to him and he said, please ask God if he can let me take at least something to heaven. And so the angel was like, well that's not typically allowed, but I'll, I'll ask and see what, see what God says. So the angel left and then came back another time and says, okay, well, God's per permitted you this one time, this one exception, you can take one suitcase of whatever you want to fill it with to heaven. And so the man was excited and he thought and thought about what it was he was going to take. And he decided that one of the things he was most proud of were these gold bars. And so he collected a lot of them, filled them in a suitcase, and then kept that suitcase by his bed every night. So in case he died, he could take it with him. So then death came and, and he died and then... He had that suitcase with him. He went up to heaven, went to the, the gates of heaven, and St. Peter was there to greet him, and St. Peter welcomed him. And then St. Peter saw the suitcase and was like, whoa, you can't bring anything with you to heaven. And the man was like, no, no, God gave me permission. Go check. And so Peter was like, okay, hold on. So he left, and then he's gone for a minute. comes back and says, okay, you're right. God did allow you to bring one suitcase of things, but I have to check it before we let you in. So he opens the suitcase and then he looks down, examining the gold bars, and he looks up the rich man and says, oh, he brought pavement. <laughs> so um, that kind of gets you to one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is heaven. And so that'll be the final topic. So the final topic of the last four things is heaven. So the last four things... So to, um, one of the terms that you may hear sometimes related to the end times and the last four things is the word eschatology. So eschata means the last things, the final things. And then anytime you see the suffix ology, it's the study of. So the study of the final things, the last things. And so it deals with the doctrines of the last things at the end times. And so when we say the last four things, we're specifically referring to death, judgment, heaven, and hell. These are the four last things, and we'll talk about these different um, topics, these four doctrines tonight. Whenever we're thinking of these last four things, thinking about the end times, thinking about death, it definitely puts life in perspective, and it should. It should give clarity to how we're living each and every day. If you think about just our earthly lives and how we live, we set goals for ourselves every day. Some people may set a goal that I want to finish a marathon. Some people may set a goal that I want to be an Olympic champion. Others it may be being a musician, being a baseball player, being a teacher, a doctor, a judge. We set goals for ourselves in our lives here on earth all the time. Even on a day-to-day -day basis, we set even simpler goals. Um, if it's raining, you're going to take an umbrella, or if the weatherman says it may rain, you're going to take an umbrella prepared for what may come. So we live every day thinking about goals and hopes and dreams, but how often do we sit back and contemplate on what should be our ultimate goal, which is heaven? And so whenever we think about the end times, it should really put our life in perspective. We should always be thinking about what is it that I need to do, what's necessary to get to heaven? What is it that God's asking of us? St. Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he talks to them about an athlete. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, towards the end of that chapter, he's telling them that think about an athlete. Think about how hard they work and how they train every single day, always working hard, persevering. 
and he's making them aware that we can't just snap our fingers and then overnight have our dreams achieved. We can't be an athlete, like a mar we can't achieve a marathon overnight. We can't be an Olympic, Olympic champion overnight. We have to work for it. And so St. Paul says that just like an athlete trains really hard every day for months, for years, to try to earn a crown, we should also be training spiritually to earn this imperishable crown that God offers us, which is heaven. So every day we have to be ready, be prepared, always working hard to try to get into what St. Paul kind of refers to as spiritual shape so that we can obtain God's prize for us, which is heaven. And so we have to live our life knowing that just like in this world to achieve our dreams takes work, we have to persevere, similar to heaven. It's important to think about these things, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we fall into the trap of just living in the here and now and not worrying about the future, not worrying about um, the end times or heavenly things. But reflecting on death and the end times also helps give us an awareness that Christ has promised us heaven. And so when we think of death, it gives us hope that we know that death is not the end. We know that Christ has promised us that if we persevere to the end, have faith, be obedient, that heaven is our ultimate goal. And so it gives us hope and courage in every single day as we're facing struggles and challenges that we can get through the day because we know Christ keeps his promises. And so it's important to reflect on death in the end times so that we can have a better perspective of living this life. And so death really, and death in the end times helps to put this life in perspective. If you, we, there was a study done of Americans, and one of the studies was in 2003, one was in 2013. And it looked, it asked Americans how many people believe in heaven and how many people believe in hell. And this, this was done in 2003 and 2013, and around that time, probably about 73 to 78% of Americans claimed to be Christians. So whenever they were doing these surveys, it was a large percentage of Americans were Christian at the time and still are today. So think about how many of these Americans believe in heaven and how many believe in hell. In 2003, in the survey, about 76% of Americans believed in heaven and 71% believed in hell. Ten years later, another sur survey, 62% believed in heaven, 54% believed in hell. Now this second survey went even further, and they also looked at other things. Only 44% believed that hell was a place of suffering for people where they go after they die. Only 56% believed in the devil. And then of those who believed in heaven, the majority felt they would be there. And so these numbers are definitely concerning because one of the devil's most powerful tools is to either convince us that hell does not exist, to convince us that he doesn't exist, or to convince us that if hell is real, I'm not going to be there. And so the devil, you know, he's having some success, it looks like, based on these studies, because that's his goal. Because if there is no hell, or if hell is a place that's not for me, I won't go there, then people are going to end up living their life carelessly. They're not going to feel like there's going to be any type of punishment for what they do. And so how I live right now isn't really going to matter because God's going to reward me with heaven. I'm, I'm good enough and he's merciful enough that I'll be in heaven. And so we have to definitely talk about the end times and talk about death, talk about heaven and hell and judgment. So again, so this life is put in perspective and so that we can make sure that we are living the way God wants us to live. So let's get started talking about the last four things. So the first of the four is death. Now the idea of death and an afterlife is not unique to the Judeo-Christian religion. So it's not just Jewish people and Christian people who believe in, in this afterlife. If you actually look at the Egyptian pyramids, I mean, that's a profound testimony of the Egyptians believing in life after death. They were so concerned with it that they actually invested most of their time on their, in their present life on preparing for the afterlife. So the pyramids were to help prepare a place for burial, and so their concern with the afterlife overshadowed their present life. And so the idea of death in an afterlife is not unique. But it is interesting because um, the human race, if we just kind of use our own reason, we've come up with five ideas about what happens after death. 
And then God has revealed to us there's a sixth idea, and that's the, the truth of what the reality of what happens. So the first human idea is this idea of annihilation. So there's some people that believe that death is it. That's all we have. Once we die and leave this earth, that's it. All we leave behind is our family, our reputation, our influence, but nothing else of me exists any, any longer. So we see this among materialists, Greek and Roman philosophers, and then even today we still see this idea among Jehovah's Witness and Seventh-day Adventists. So they, they believe that at death you're annihilated. The second idea is that we exist as ghosts or pale, pale shadows. So after death, that's all that exists of us is we just become a ghost. We just constantly are wondering and that's how we spend our, the rest of our life after death. And so this is popular among some ancient tribes and cultures, um, some Greeks, Babylonians, Assyrians, some Egyptians, this idea that we're just ghosts or pale shadows roaming around. Some have come up with an idea of reincarnation. So once we die, we'll return to Earth in a different mortal body of some sort. You see this in some of the Eastern um, religions. And then a fourth idea is that there's this natural immortality of the soul. But the groups who believe in this believe that after we die, we survive as like a spirit, almost just like an angel. But a lot of these groups believe that the body is a prison, and so that after we die, our soul escapes and is finally free of this prison. So that's the Gnostics had some of this idea to some degree. Um, Platonism had this to some degree. Fifth idea is this sense of cosmic consciousness. This is a Hindu Buddhist idea where the only thing that survives after death is the only thing that was real before it. Just this cosmic consciousness, something that transcends the individual. It's just this perfect eternal um, Buddha mind type thing. And so those are five ideas that just human reason and different human um, religions have come up with. And then God gives us the sixth idea. This is what he has revealed as the reality of the afterlife. Is that there's, he promises the immortality of the body as well as the immortality of the soul. And so in Christianity, God has revealed that not only is our soul immortal, but at the end of time, all men will experience a bodily resurrection. And then all men will have their bodies and souls reunited and they'll live, the, the body and soul will live forever. And so all men, good and wicked, will have the resurrection take place. Now for those who have been good in their earthly lives and obedient to God, then he's also promised them that their bodies will not only be resurrected and reunited with their souls, it'll also be transformed and glorified. And so of these six views, we know that the, the view that God has revealed is the only true view, but we also see that God's view, God's reality, is only in Christianity where man becomes something better and more perfect than he was even before death. So after death we have this potential to become even greater than we were before. And so it's only in Christianity that God has revealed that this is the reality. This is the, the promise that he's given us. And that gives us a lot of hope. So when we're talking about what is death, the first thing we have to look at is well, what is a human person? So a human person is a rational being and we're composed of body, a material body, and an immaterial soul. And so the soul is the life-giving principle to the body. So once God, at every time a person is conceived, God immediately creates the soul for that person immediately and infuses it into the embryo. And so from that moment you have a human person, body and soul united, and the soul is that life-giving principle to the body. The soul gives life to the body. And our soul is rational. It means we have an intellect and a will. A human, a rational human being is able to think, able to reason, able to choose right or choose wrong. A human can laugh. A human can understand abstract things. And then we can cooperate with God and His grace or we can reject it. Our soul is spiritual. There's no matter. And so because of this, it's immortal. Once God creates the soul, it lives forever unless God were to act upon it and destroy it. And God promises that he wouldn't do that. But because there's no parts, 
the soul can't die. It can't break down or decay or corrupt because it has no parts. So once God creates it, the soul is immortal. Now the body is matter. It's composed of material things. And so because of that, it will corrupt and it will break down over time. Now whenever God created humanity, whenever he created Adam and Eve, he gave man the gift of immortality. He gave them this gift of not letting their mortal bodies break down. It would not corrupt. It would have lived forever without decaying. But then Adam and Eve committed sin and so they fell. And part of that punishment was the taking away of this gift of immortality. And so every, everyone who descends from Adam and Eve, all of us, have, the, have this mortal body that does d decay and does corrupt. So unless God acts upon the body, it will decay and corrupt. So death, in a just kind of a foundational understanding of it, is a reduction of something into its component parts. So for a human, we're composed of body and soul. So death is the separation into our parts. Our body and soul are separated. And that life-giving principle, the soul, is separated from the body. And so the body will corrupt over time, and then the soul will continue to exist even after death. And again, these, this is the case unless God were to act upon it. Now the Catechism has a lot about death. I'm just going to quote a few sections of it. So the Catechism reminds us that death is the end of this earthly life. By remembering our mortality, it helps us realize we only have a limited time to act, on, act with God's grace. Right now is a time of grace. God offers us grace. He asks us to cooperate it so that we can bring our lives to fulfillment and to be with Him in heaven. And at death, it's an end to that time of grace. Once we die, then that's the end of our time of grace. So once we die, um, our more eternal destinies will be, be made known. Death is a consequence of sin. So as I mentioned, Adam and Eve were given this gift of immortality. They would not die. They would not corrupt. They would not decay. But because of sin, that gift was taken away. And so now death is a part of the world, a part of reality for, for humanity. The Catechism also reminds us that Scripture tells us that death has been transformed by Jesus Christ. Because Christ came and became incarnate and died for us on the cross and then resurrected, He has now transformed this curse of death into a blessing. Because now, at death, life is not ended, it's just changed. And we have the promise of the resurrection at the end of time. And so we know that this curse of death is not a curse anymore in Christ. It's a blessing. For those who die in Christ, they have the promise of a, be, the body and soul be, being reunited at the end of time, and then their bodies will be transformed and glorified. And the Catechism also says that death is the end, end of man's earthly pilgrimage. Now sometimes this idea of death can bring fear to a lot of people. Um, it, it can, in our culture we can even see that. We see people spending millions and millions of dollars to try to look younger or try to stop aging or try to make death not happen. Um, we see people individually spending a lot of money for drugs and surgeries to look younger and younger to try to deny this reality that death does happen. But this stems from a misunderstanding of death. People are afraid of it. But we shouldn't be afraid of death. We should be afraid of sin. Because it's if we die in sin that a lot of we're not going to be able to get to heaven and be able to have this glorified body. And so it's sin, not death, that we should be afraid of. Because death has been defeated by Christ. And as St. Paul tells us that he, death, um, Christ has had a victory over death. He's conquered death. And so we can look, we can, we'll experience death. It may be painful. It may not be something that during the time that, that is something that we want to, to, want to experience. But we can still look at death and look beyond and look forward to the resurrection. Now the church encourages us to always prepare for our hour of death. And the catechism tells us that and this is quoting from the Catechism, every action of yours, every thought, should be those of one who expects to die before the day is out. If you're not fit to face death today, it's very unlikely you will be tomorrow. And so the Catechism just reminds us that at death, life is not ended, but it's changed, it's transformed. Death is a separation. It's not an end. It may be painful, but it's not final. And so this separation will be healed by the grace of God if we continue to be in Christ and it, 
when we die, if we're found to be in a state of grace, we'll be able to be rewarded with all that God has promised us. Now, Father Benedict Rochelle has this quote that I think is powerful and sums up what we've been talking about related to death. He says, Death is a powerful teacher and has many lessons to teach us. Learn from death that nothing in this world lasts forever. Learn from death not to cling to anything in such a way that you can't go on without it. Instead, learn to refer all things to eternity. Do not be so comfortable with anything in this world that you will be unprepared to leave it. Now is death the end? No, and I've already hinted that God has promised the resurrection. And so the resurrection is going to be when our bodies and souls are reunited, and this is for all men, the good and the wicked. Everyone at the end of time will have their bodies resurrected and reunited with their souls. Now it's only those who die in the state of grace who will be given the glorified bodies. So the wicked will still have the resurrection of the bodies, the bodies and souls will be reunited, and they'll be immortal, but they won't have experienced the glorified body that those who are blessed will experience. And we'll talk more about this later. So with the resurrection, we can see St. Paul in quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Lo, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. And there's a few other scripture passages you can refer to talking about the resurrection, but he's just emphasizing that in a sudden moment, on the last day, we'll be resurrected, and in a moment we'll be changed, we'll be transformed. Our mortal bodies will take on immortality. Now we talked about the, the last day and the second coming some last week and I'm not going to spend much time on that other than just to mention a few things and I want to set the stage for the next topic of the last four things for the judgment. And I'm going to set the stage by t briefly kind of talking about the last day and the second coming um, to summarize what I said last week and to give you a few other quotes that I didn't mention last week. So the last day on the last day, this is when Christ will come again, His second coming, also called the parousia. It's also when the resurrection of the bodies will take place. And then we will experience the general judgment. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And then Scripture tells us there will be a creation of a new heavens and a new earth, some type of transformation of the physical universe that will take place. So with Christ's second coming, we do not know when it's going to take place. It's unknown to us. Scripture just tells us to always be prepared. But it will be obvious and it will be visible. Anyone who is alive at that time will see Christ coming again. And then he'll come as the just judge to sit on his throne and to judge all of humanity. And he will come in power and in majesty. And he'll be surrounded by numerous angels. Christ's coming will strike fear and fear and awe into everyone, both the good and the wicked, and then all the earth will tremble at His coming. Now one thing to also comment on, now we know that most people are going to experience death, but the church also recognizes that, as we talked about last time, the church will face, the whole humanity will face a severe tribulation at the end times. This is called the Great Tribulation. So all humanity will experience it. It will be the most severe persecutions and suffering that man's ever faced. Now there will be some people that survive that because even the tribulation cannot destroy the church. We don't know what, how large that number will be. It could be a small remnant, we don't know. But there will be some people in the church who do survive it. And so those people who don't experience death, Scripture tells us they will witness the second coming. And then once the second coming happens, those who are still alive, who are good and in, united to Christ and in a state of grace, will be joined with those who are then resurrected from the dead and then they will be taken up into the air to greet Christ and then escort him down to sit on his throne to judge all of humanity. Now whenever he comes, this is Psalm uh, 97 and this kind of gives you, I'm going to read this just to give you, set the, set the scene, give you a sense for what is being experienced at this moment. I'm going to read a couple passages. So Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. 
let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. His lightnings lighten the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples behold his glory. In Isaiah chapter 13, Well, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty it will come. Therefore all hands will be feeble, and every man's heart will melt, and they will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in travail. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the earth a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will darken at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pride of the arrogant and lay low the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And so we're setting the stage for what's happening at Christ's second coming. And then the last passage I want to read from is Matthew. But this is talking about how when Christ comes with the angels, there'll be a sign in the heavens. So Matthew 24, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So we can already start to get a sense from Scripture that this coming of Christ does come with some, some fear, some trembling, but there's also great glory and awe. And then there's this sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And I didn't touch on this last week, but I wanted to bring it up just real briefly today. The church fathers discuss what this could mean. And some church fathers say that it's the sign of the cross that will appear in the air, whether it's just an actual symbol or if it's the cross of Calvary. But Thomas Aquinas actually gives an interesting uh, perspective, and he speculates that what's going to happen is when he comes again, the angels who are accompanying him, some of them will carry the, the instruments of the Passion. So some of them will be carrying the crucifix, the cross from Calvary. Some of them will be carrying the pillar that he was scourged on. Some of them will, someone will carry the lance that stabbed his side. Some will carry the hammer and the nails, the, the crown of thorns, the seamless tunic, and then anything else that may have been used whenever he experienced his passion. And Thomas Aquinas says that this is to make visibly manifest to everyone how many and how great was the suffering of Christ for our sake. So everyone can be reminded at the end of time what Christ did for us. So that as they come to face judgment, they will be able to see their own lives in perspective to what Christ did. And I'm sure most of you know the famous painting by Michelangelo that's in the Sistine Chapel. This is the Day of Judgment painting. And if you look at it, there's so many details that are actually pretty amazing in this um, artwork if you take time to look at all the details and everything he's trying to portray. But if you look in the top right and left corners, he's actually showing us what Th Thomas Aquinas even talked about and speculated. In the center, you see Jesus standing in judgment. On the right side are, the, are going to be at the bottom. The right side are the good and the bottom are the wicked. But then you look at the top. They're carrying the cross from Calvary with the crown of thorns. And on the opposite side, they're carrying the pillar and the lance. And so he's already starting to portray some of what Thomas Aquinas speculated uh, may be happening, is that the angels will come with Christ carrying those instruments to remind everyone of exactly what it was that Christ did for us. And so I'm not going to spend any more time on the second coming because we talked about it a little bit last week. But I just wanted to set the stage because this is what's going to take place at the time of the general judgment, the last judgment. And so that brings us to part three, number three of the last four things. Or I'm sorry, number two of the last four things. We have death and then we have judgment. So judgment. There's two types of judgment 
that Scripture and the church teaches us are going to take place. One is called the particular judgment, and one is called the general judgment. So the particular judgment. The particular judgment is going to take place at the time of death. So at death, as we mentioned, this is the separation of the body and the soul. So the body will go back into the earth and, and, and decay and corrupt and it will return to dust. The soul will continue to exist. And so because the soul is immortal and continues to exist, I'm immediately judged at that point. And so at death we experience our particular judgment. So as soon as we die and our body and soul are separated, we experience judgment. And this is called the particular judgment. It's personal. It's I myself will be judged at that moment. And so it's particular to me and personal to me. But at that moment, my eternal destiny will be known. And so we have man who's judged. And at the particular judgment, I'm going to know that I'm either going to be in hell eternally or I'm going to be in heaven eternally. Now, if I'm judged to be in hell, my soul will immediately go to hell. And if I'm judged to be in heaven, my soul will either immediately go to heaven if I'm innocent, pure, um, with no stains, no imperfections, or I'll go to purgatory um, and then be purified and cleansed and then go to heaven. And we're going to talk about purgatory more next week. But it's just a process. You're already going to know my eternal destiny is heaven, but I have to be purged and cleansed before I can enter heaven. And so at my particular judgment, I'm going to know what my eternal destiny is. So at the moment of death, eternity has begun, and there's nothing that I can do at that point to change my eternal destiny. It's sealed. From the moment that I die, it's sealed my eternal destiny. It's either heaven or hell. And so the Catechism tells us that each will be rewarded immediately after death in accordance with his works and faith. Each man receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of his death in a particular judgment. And in Scripture we can see some examples of this. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that, judgment. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, Jesus is telling an account of a rich man and Lazarus who both die. Um, and we're not going to delve into that passage, but basically they're immediately judged. They both are immediately um, sent to separate um, states of being at that time. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, Paul says that we, f we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive recompense according to what he did in the body, whether good or evil. Now this could be referring to the general judgment, but it also could be referring to the particular judgment. We're going to be judged based on what we did in our earthly body, how we cooperated with God's grace, or how we rejected God's grace. And so you're judged by what you did in your earthly life. Now the general judgment, when Jesus comes at his second coming on the last day, as I mentioned, we'll experience the resurrection of the bodies, and then will then will come the general judgment. We see this in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And then they'll be judged by what they did. And as it even says in Scripture, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. And so you have the sheep being sent to eternal life and the goats being sent to eternal punishment. And so this is an example, a portrayal of what's going to happen at the general judgment. We also see this in Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 13. This is John in a vision. He says that, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. All were judged by what they had done. John chapter 5, verses 28 to 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. 
And then Matthew chapter 13 says something similar. At the close of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But again, this idea at the end of time, there's going to be this separation that takes place, the wicked and the righteousness. So the big question, so why are there two judgments? Why is there a particular judgment and a general judgment? Well, the particular judgment is particular and personal to me. My final destiny is sealed. So the general judgment is not going to change my final destiny at all. I will already know my final destiny. But, it, but the particular judgment is personal to me. The general judgment, there are several reasons why this is necessary and why it's fitting that this takes place. And you can see this in a lot of different writings um, with, among the church, but I'm going to refer to Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas says, and I'm going to paraphrase what he's talking about, but he's basically saying that our general judgment is not to redetermine our standing in front of God. Our eternal destinies will be known. It will already have been sealed at the particular judgment. So the particular judgment will experience our personal um, pronouncement. We will be proclaimed our eternal destiny. Since our destiny is sealed, it can't be changed. But, but the general judgment is so that we can see the full implications of what we did in our life. So at our, at our death, people are still going to live on who are going to have been touched by us and influenced by us, whether good or bad. We have people who follow our example, who are influenced by us in various ways, people who imitate you, and that will continue even after you've died. So something that you did to another person to influence them to do good or to do evil will continue on through them. And then who knows, they may continue to pass that on to others, and it all started from something they did imitating you. And so at your, personal, at your particular judgment, that won't all be fully understood by you or revealed to you. Um, and so at the general judgment, you're going to be able to see the full implications of what happened because of you in your life. And so Thomas Aquinas says there's several things. We don't live in isolation. God created us in His image, and God is a trinity. He's a community of persons. And so when God created humanity, He created us in His image as a communal being, as a social being. We, are not, we don't live in isolation, so everything we do affects not only my relationship with myself and with God, but also with others. And so whenever we sin, or whenever we do things that are good, they affect other people. So this general judgment is to make these full, ram full ramifications known of everything we did, good and evil. I, look, I think of it as like a ripple effect. When you drop a stone into water, the ripple just doesn't happen in one place. It continues to spread. And so just like that happens with the ripple in the rock, our lives do the same thing. They impact many other people. And sometimes we don't even realize who is watching and who is imitating us, good or bad. So this general judgment will show us and show all of humanity the, the implications of what I did. Because we're communal creatures, this general judgment is also fitting because it's done in a visible way amongst the entire community of men and angels. So all the men and all the angels are present. This general judgment is visible so that this community that we live among, among will see everything that I did, the implications of everything that I did, and the effects good and bad they had. And so it's not to redetermine our standing, but it's so we can see the full implications of our lives and their effects on others. And it's done in a visible, communal way. And then also Aquinas and the church talks to us about that a lot of times in this life we don't see the depths of goodness and the depths of virtue in a person. But similarly, we also don't always see the hidden wickedness. Hidden wickedness. And so this general judgment is to expose pretenses, to expose hypocrisy, to expose any type of false virtues, but also to show people how good this person was and how deeply virtuous they were. And so we're go it's going to be revealed um, who pe the, the hearts of people. We're going to see the hearts of people. It's also done at the end, after the resurrection, so that now that we're reunited body and soul, our eternal destiny is given to us as a body and a soul, since it was both in body and soul that we sinned or that we did these good things. So that judgment will be given to us, body and soul. And so Aquinas says it's only fitting that not only our soul, but also our body, united to our soul, is given its final judgment. But more than anything, this general judgment is to show God's justice and God's mercy. 
And so the, the general judgment, the final judgment, will demonstrate that God rewards his rewards and his promises, his rewards and his punishments match his promises. So he has promised that those who do good, those who live in a state of grace, those who cooperate with his grace are going to be given eternal life. And those who reject him and reject his grace will be sent to eternal condemnation. And so we're going to be able to visibly see in a public way God's justice and God's mercy, both for those who are good and go to heaven and those who aren't and go to hell. We'll be able to see God's justice and his mercy and how everything is interconnected. We'll see his goodness and his glory. And so the general judgment is for these things. Now scripture also shows us that this is the, the situation of the general judgment. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, The one who judges me is the Lord. For he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will manifest the motives of our hearts. And in Luke chapter 12, There is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, nor secret that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the darkness will be heard in the light. And the Catechism refers to this as well. It says that the resurrection of all the dead, of both the just and unjust, will precede the last judgment. And then in the presence of Christ, who is truth itself, the truth of each man's relationship with God will be laid bare. The last judgment will reveal, even to its furthest consequences, the good each person has done or failed to do in his earthly life. The Catechism continues in number 1041. The message of the last judgment calls men to conversion while God is still giving them the acceptable time. It inspires a holy fear of God and commits them to the justice of the kingdom of God. At this final judgment, Christ will say, the time of grace is past. So there's no more earthly life, no more time to cooperate with God's grace. The time of grace has passed. The time of justice has come. Everyone will be judged based on his works, what he has done, good or evil, in the body, in his earthly life. Those who have done good will go, to, go with Christ into eternal life. And those who have done evil will be cast into everlasting torment and anguish. All creation will see and acknowledge Christ's perfect justice. Now, Pope Benedict XVI, when he wrote Spe Salvi, one of his encyclicals, he talks about how a lot of times when we think about the Last Judgment, immediately the, what comes to mind is fear and terror. We're all frightened by this idea. But Pope Benedict says that it really should be an object of hope, though. Because the, one of the most basic human aspirations is to see justice, to see an undoing of all the past that's been suffered, to see a reparation, to set things right, to see goodness rewarded and evil punished. And Pope Benedict says that the general judgment will do this. It will respond to that deep human aspiration to see justice. And Pope Benedict says that the injustices of history will not get the final word because we'll be able to see how everything works together for good and how everything works together um, for God's goodness, mercy, and love. Pope Benedict says that this fear, there is this fear associated with it because it evokes a sense of responsibility because we realize how important every decision is in our life. And so there is some a fear associ associated with that. But he says that we still have to see that this is a demonstration of God's justice. And so it's something that gives us consolation and hope in the end. Now with the general judgment, it's proposed that what will happen is that, and this is just speculation, some of the church fathers have proposed this, that what will happen is that the angels and demons will be our accusers, our witnesses. And so for the just, it's proposed that what will happen is our guardian angels will be able to counter every charge the demon may bring against us. And they'll be able to counter it with all the goodness we've done, how we've cooperated with God's grace, how we've um, done virtue, participated in the sacraments, done prayer. And so all be laid on a scale of divine justice and it'll show that our good outweighs our sinfulness. For the wicked, it's speculated that their sins will outweigh any good that they had done and it'll be made known publicly that they rejected God and His grace. And Thomas Aquinas and others, they say that man often, if he's punished, he wants it to be done in secret because shame makes that punishment even more severe. 
But that's exactly why this general judgment will take place, because now the wicked, they'll suffer severe punishment, knowing that they dis dis disgrace God, but now it'll be made publicly. And so it'll bring, bring even greater shame, because it's public. this public shame and contempt will be even more suffering for the wicked. So this is just a, one depiction of the Last Judgment. And you see Christ in the center, and then the apostles surrounding him, the angels surrounding him, and then you see the wicked on one side and the good on the other. And then you see the wicked going into everlasting condemnation, to everlasting torment, and then the good going into everlasting life, eternal life with Peter, and into the gates of heaven. So as you just reflect on this picture, some of the things that Christ might say on this last day to the just. Come, come you good and faithful servant. Come, you who did the will of my Father. Come, for when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. When I was a stranger, you took me in. Come, you have loved me and sought to promote my glory above everything else. Come, the time of suffering and sorrow is over. Now enter into eternal joy and happiness, which no one can take from you. Come with me into everlasting life. And then to those on his left, to the wicked, Christ might say, O oh, you foolish and blind sinners, in your arrogance and pride, you caused injury to me, to my church, and to my brothers and sisters. When I was hungry, thirsty, naked, and a stranger, you neglected me. You say, Lord, Lord, but, when, but you did not do the will of my Father. Out of love I came down from heaven for you and died for you, yet my love awakened no response in your hearts. Some of you treated me with contempt and hatred, and others treated me with indifference. How often I reached out to you, but you would not be listened or you would not listen or be moved. You deliberately chose to serve the devil. Depart from me into everlasting fire. Now, our, our, our eternal destiny is something that we see referred to many times in Scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 30, and then in the Didache, which is an early um, writing, sometime probably between 60 to 90 AD. But it talks about this quote it says, There are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between these two ways. And so ultimately this is in reference to heaven and hell. And so Peter Kreeft, I think, has a great line. The height of the mountain is measured by the depth of the valley. The greatness of salvation is appreciated against the awfulness of damnation, what we are saved from. And so I think it's important that we start off by talking about hell. What is it that we hope to be saved from? so that we can really measure the mount, the height of the mountain compared to the depth of the valley. So hell. And these are the last two things of the four things is heaven and hell. So we're going to start with hell. What is it that we hope to be saved from? So what is hell? In scripture we see a lot of different phrases and words used to describe hell. We may see the word abyss, place of torments, place of fire, Furnace of fire, unquenchable fire, everlasting fire, darkness, destruction, corruption, and death. St. Paul uses a phrase related to heaven, but he says in 1 Corinthians, The eye has not seen, the ear has not heard what God has ready for those who love him. But we can also use this same phrase that in relation to hell because man cannot comprehend what God has prepared for those who reject and insult him. So if the joys of heaven surpass our imagination, will not the torments of hell be inconceivably greater than anything we could have imagined? And in reality, the doctrine of hell is so frightening that there's many groups, even people who claim to be Christian groups who have either denied the existence of hell or who have modified the doctrine. And so these are just some of those groups who either reject or modify this doctrine. And so these groups, 
I mean, largely probably related to the fact that hell is this frightening idea, have modified it. So scripture tells us that those who say there is no God are fools. Well, similarly, those who say there is no hell are also fools um, because it is more pleasing and agreeable to say, to say there is no hell because then we can think and live as we please. But this is living in an illusion and it's very dangerous because it's a reality for everyone and we have to be aware of that in this life. And scripture abounds with evidence that hell exists and that it's eternal and everlasting. And these are just some samples of, of some examples in scripture. So Matthew 25, it's everlasting fire for the wicked. It's eternal punishment. And Mark 9, it's where the worm does not die, where the fire is not quenched. Revelation 20, it's the everlasting fire of torment. And there's several other passage, passages you can refer to that clearly show that hell is a reality and it's everlasting. In Jeremiah chapter 23, it says, I will bring upon you everlasting reproach and perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. Matthew 22 verse 13, thrown into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Revelation 14, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. So hell is a reality. Scripture tells us, and the church has always taught it. And in hell, there will be everlasting pains that will torment, torment the people there forever. Now the church fathers tell us that there are two different types of pain that will be experienced. One's referred to as the pain of the senses, or the pain of sense. And it's where all the senses are tortured. And then there's the pain of the loss of God. And we're going to talk about those. So these everlasting pains that those in hell will suffer, the pain of sense and the pain of loss of God, pain of the loss of God. So the pain of sense. So we can look to each of the senses and see in some way they're going to be tortured. Now sight. The people in hell are going to be surrounded by darkness and smoke. Now some church fathers propose that those in hell will be incurably blind, but others say that they will be able to see but the appearance of each other will, be un will in inspire unimaginable horror and terror. It will be just a horrific sight if they're able to see. And it will be surrounded by darkness and smoke. Smell. They'll be surrounded by an offensive stench that they're all emitting. And the men that are there along with the demons that are there. Taste. There will be an intense hunger and an intense thirst. So you can imagine on earth we may experience at times thirst or hunger, but this would be nothing comparable. It'll be so extremely painful and excruciating, and it's one where they know they'll never be quenched. They will never be able to satisfy their hunger and thirst. Touch, there'll be unquenchable physical suffering of the pains of fire, and it'll be a fire that does not consume. It'll burn them, but not consume them. And it'll be eternal, unquenchable fire. Hearing, so forever and ever, their torments will be heard. They'll be, have, th have these unending cries and howls of woeful lamentations. Just constantly their cries will be going out. Sometimes the church fathers say that they also think sometimes they'll be shouting blasphemous words or ugly words. Um, there'll just be this constant noise of, her of a horrific sound. The intellect, the reason, the memory, um, that sense will be tortured because they'll be separated from God. But not only that... They'll have this eternal remorse. They know that they're there because they put themselves there. This wasn't something that God had condemned them to. It's something they freely chose. And so they'll be aware of this eternally. They'll be aware of all the graces that God had offered them during their life that they rejected and refused. They'll recognize that it was some of the things they chose to do or not to do that put them there not practicing virtue, not keeping the commandments, not doing the will of God, not partaking of the sacraments, not listening to Christ and His church, by rejecting God or being indifferent to God, by being slothful in spirit. All these things they'll recognize were things they rejected to do, failed to do, and so they know they're there by their own doing, and so that constantly torments them. They'll also have eternal shame and anguish, 
The church fathers say that they think they'll be branded in some way, so they're always reminded of what it was they did that, got, that, that resulted in them being in hell. Something they will be a constant reminder of their sins. And they'll have this unending sorrow, never-ending sorrow. And we can read Isaiah chapter 65, verses 12 to 14, that gives us a sense of the state of those in hell. But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, I will destine you to the sword, and all of you shall bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called you, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen. But you did what was evil in my eyes, and chose what I did not delight in. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. Behold, my servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. Behold, my servants shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart and shall wail for anguish of spirit. Now, as I mentioned, the second thing they suffer, the second type of pain, was the pain of sense and then the pain of loss. So they have complete separation from God. And this will far outweigh every other torment they're experiencing. And this isn't just the mere absence of superior happiness. It's an intensely positive pain. It's something they can feel. Um, they're very acutely aware that everything that, that they're experiencing right now is because of their own doing. It humiliates them. It depresses them upon measure. They fall into despair. They now have seen God's infinite beauty, His infinite goodness. They now have realized God is their ultimate fulfillment to the happiness, to all the desires they've ever experienced. God is the fulfillment for them. They know now that He is the only thing that could satisfy that. And now they're separated from Him forever. So they're irresistibly drawn to God, yet they're eternally unfulfilled. So their souls are yearning for fulfillment, for joy, for truth, for goodness. And they realize it's only found in God who they're completely separated, with, separated from for eternity. And so they're completely unfulfilled. There's an utter void. They're in immeasurable anguish because of this. So now they're aware that God, the one on whom I entirely depend, is now my enemy forever. And this is just overwhelming to them. So they see God's infinite beauty, His infinite goodness, His power, His wisdom. They recognize that Christ was God, second person of the Trinity, who became incarnate, suffered the Paschal mystery for us as a sign of God's unconditional love to reach out to us, and they still rejected Him. And so they see this God of love and goodness and mercy, and now they're separated from that forever. <coughs> The Catechism, uh, number 1033, says that we cannot be united with God unless we freely choose to love Him. But we cannot love God if we sin gravely against Him, against our neighbor, or against ourselves. He who does not love remains in death. And so to die in mortal sin without repenting and accepting God's merciful love means remaining separated from Him forever by our own free choice. And this state of definitive self-exclusion from the communion of God and from the blessed is called hell. And then Catechism 1036 reminds us that these teachings on hell are to be an urgent call to conversion. Every single day, trying to draw closer and closer to God, cooperate with His grace, and convert, turn to God more and more deeply each day. And Catechism reminds us that we do not know the day nor the hour of our judgment. So we should always be prepared and be ready. Now, one of the things that's also important to emphasize that the Catechism mentions is in number 1037 in the Catechism. God predestines no one to go to hell. So there's, it's never the situation where before time, before we were created, that God had already decided some are going to heaven and some are going to hell. He never decided anyone was going to heaven. God never decided that. That's something that is our own free choice to do. And so those who go to hell, it's because of their own willful turning away from God. So committing a mortal sin and persevering in it, not repenting, that's what makes someone be judged and condemned to hell. 
And so that's one of the reasons the church would never make any kind of claim stating that the church knows any particular person's in, in hell. Only God knows our hearts at the moment of death. And so the church just re re continues to remain silent. So you can think about some of the people who we think are just the most wicked. Um, we know about Judas and the scriptures who betrayed our Lord, Hitler, Stalin, um, all these people. The church is not going to make any type of statement one way or the other because it's only God who knows the heart of that person at the moment of their death. So the church leaves it up to God and his mercy and his justice to, to determine that person's eternal destiny. So the church does not ever make a statement one way or the other. Now the church will be able to know if there's any particular person in heaven. And those are the people the church has claimed are saints the saints in heaven, but we know there's many more people in heaven than just the, the number of the saints the church has, but the church can recognize that in various ways. And so some of them are miracles and, and other things of declaring someone to be a saint, but that's as far as the church will go. The church would never say any particular person's in hell because we leave that to God. And another important topic related to this is how many people will go to hell? How many people will be in hell? Are not most people saved? Well, unfortunately, this is a recurring idea throughout history, throughout the centuries, this idea of universe, universal salvation, this idea that most people will be in heaven, that either no one's in hell or very few people are in hell, is sometimes a teaching that you hear people proclaiming, different theologians, whether they're Catholic or Protestant. Various people over the centuries have put this forward, but the church says this is not true. It is not true that there's this idea of universal salvation because we look at scripture and look at what Jesus himself tells us. Matthew chapter 17 verses 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Matthew 22, verses 13 to 14. This is the parable of the wedding banquet where the king held a banquet and invited various guests. And so a guest entered who did not have the wedding garment. And so the king told the attendants to bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus says, For many are called, but few are chosen. And then the last passage, and this is in response to the disciples asking Christ a question. Luke chapter 13 verses 23 to 24. And someone said to him, Lord, will, will those who are saved be few? And Jesus said to them, strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And so the church tells us that hell is a possibility for anyone. And we do not know how many people will be in hell or how many people will be in heaven. But based on Jesus' words, we do know that he is suggesting that there will be many people that choose the easy road, the broad way, and there will be few people that choose the narrow way, the difficult way. And so the saints, St. Saint Paul, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Augustine, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, and all the other saints, if you read their writings, they'll oftentimes discuss hell. And they themselves would shudder and tremble at the thought of hell because they knew that every single day they were in danger themselves of potentially deserving it. Because every day they were surrounded by temptations and by the world and by wickedness. And so they encourage everyone to see the reality of hell and see the dangers around us and see these dangers are real. And as long as we're alive and on this earth, we'll be faced with both external and internal temptations and dangers. But this reality of hell is not imposed on us by God. It's imposed on, by ourselves. And so we have to always be vigilant to stay in a state of grace so that at the end of time, at the end of our earthly lives, the moment of our death, we will not be out of a state of grace. The reality of hell is not to inspire despair and hopelessness. It should actually be move us to convert daily, turn to Christ, turn to God more and more deeply. And we should actually be moved to actually fear sin. And then if we do sin, to repent as soon as possible. And the reality of hell should inspire us to live each and every day with heaven as our goal. We have to always be examining our lives. Are, do we have a, are we lukewarm in our faith? Are we indifferent? Are we careless? Are we neglecting God's instruments of grace? Are we committing sin? 
Are we living with vices or virtues? And God gives us this gift of grace for our salvation. So are we cooperating with it? Are we striving to do our will? Or are we striving to do God's will? So the reality of hell should help us to evaluate our lives each and every day. But scripture also warns us, as does the catechism, that hell is not to inspire despair, but it's also not to inspire presumption. So presumption is this idea of saying, well, God's merciful. He's not going to condemn me to hell. His mercy is great. I'll be fine. And in Sirach chapter 5, verses 4 to 7, it actually responds to this idea of someone saying, well, God is merciful, so I'm gonna, I can live how I want. It, Sirach says, Do not say, I sinned and what happy to me, for the Lord is slow to anger. Do not be so confident of atonement that you add sin upon sin. Do not say, His mercy is great. He will forgive the multitude of my sins. For both mercy and wrath are with him, and his anger rests on sinners. Do not delay to turn to the Lord, nor postpone it from day to day. For suddenly the wrath of the Lord will go forth, and at the time of punishment you will perish. So it reminds us both to have a balance. Don't fall into despair, but also don't fall into presumption. Have the middle ground where every day we're examining our lives, being more deeply converted to draw closer and closer to Christ every day. And then if we do sin, to repent as soon as possible, but try to avoid sin as well. Scripture tells us that we need to not follow the worldly way. That worldly way is the broad path that's easy. We follow Christ. He is the way. And His way is the narrow path. It's difficult, but we have to pick up our cross and follow Him every day. We have to persevere until the end. And we always need to rely on God's grace because we can do all things if we're in Christ and with Christ. And then the other important thing is keep heaven as your goal. If you want to be able to avoid hell, then aim for heaven and keep continue to persevere and strive for that. And so that leads us into our next, the, the fourth of the last four things, heaven. So heaven, so what is heaven? I will start off by saying that St. Augustine even admitted that it's very difficult for us to fully comprehend and explain what awaits us in heaven. But we can definitely use scripture and some of the teaching of the church to help us get at least an idea of it. In scripture, there's many words used to refer to heaven. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, kingdom of the Father, kingdom of Christ, the city of God, paradise, life everlasting, joy of the Lord, the crown of life, the crown of glory, an incorruptible crown, a treasure, where we will see God's face, our Father's house, a heavenly banquet, and wedding supper of the Lamb. Now, heaven is not simply just a spiritual realm where there's only souls and, and angels and spiritual beings. Because if you recall, Christ is there now in his glorified body, and his resurrected body, along with Mary. We just celebrated the Feast of the Assumption. So Mary, body and soul are in heaven. So heaven's not just a spiritual realm. And at the end of time, we know that we'll all be resurrected. And those going to heaven will receive a glorified body and will live in heaven with Christ and the angels and the saints. And so it's not just spiritual. We're also told that it is so beautiful and glorious that you'll never tire of contemplating all the splendors of eternity. Every time we think of the word heaven and what is awaiting a person in heaven, it should just fill you with awe every time you start to think about it. But it is something that's beyond our imagination. And so here's the quote from St. Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, in heaven, we'll retain our thinking and our feeling, our memory. Nothing of our humanity is lost or diminished. It's actually perfected. Scripture tells us that we'll see God face to face. We'll see God as He is. And this is called the beatific vision. 
there'll be this direct intuition they'll be able to see God clearly and distinctly although the church fathers aren't sure what this means and St. Augustine talks about this in, in um, several of his writings will we be seeing God with our physical eyes or, or how will we be seeing God and he, he, his ultimate conclusion was we don't really know but one of the ways we can kind of try to understand it is that St. Paul tells us that looking around right now in our earthly lives we are given a reflection of God through creation so we see God and his reflection in creation and in the landscape, in nature, and other human beings. But this is only a reflection, and St. Paul tells us this is foggy and dim. It's a foggy and dim mirror of who God truly is. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, is when he says that, for, we need, we, we, for, we now, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then in heaven we'll see face to face. And so we can just take that to try to grasp even just a tiny shred of what heaven will be like. So we look around at creation, just think of little babies and how much joy and delight that brings, how beautiful they are. And if we think about scenes, mountains, lakes, beautiful visions in the sky, water, oceans, beaches, waterfalls, flowers and forests, all these different things of cre creation bring all these emotions within us, beauty and joy, peace, tranquility. These, and then we take Paul's words, this is only a foggy reflection of how beautiful and glorious heaven will be. So you can take the most amazing things you see on this earth and know that it's not even coming close to comparing to how beautiful and glorious heaven will be. And so Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive what God has prepared. And so our language is at a loss to describe it because all we've really experienced are creatures and cre material things. So John in the book of Revelation uses some figurative language to try to give us even a hint at the glory and majesty of heaven. So we can see in the book of Revelation, this is chapter 21 verses 1 to 5. Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, verses 19 to 21. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every jewel, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made, a, made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. So again, all John is trying to do is just give us an image using things we can relate to because our language is at a loss. There really are no words to describe how beautiful and glorious heaven is. So John uses some figurative language to try to help us even start to conceive faintly what heaven will be like. And so what will life in heaven be like? There will be perpetual health, perpetual rest, perpetual happiness. There will not be the least amount of pain or sadness. There will be a superabundance of joy. Every possible desire will find perfect satisfaction. And then whatever could increase one's joy and delight will be present. And then the will of all those in heaven will be united with God. So my will will be perfectly united and in harmony with God's will. We will still have our free will, but it'll still, be, it'll still be perfectly united that we would never sin or ever desire to sin because we're loving God so perfectly. And we'll be able to delight greatly in the company of Christ, with Mary, with the angels, with the saints, and then we'll be reunited with anyone we may have known on earth who's now in heaven, but we'll also know others. So everyone in heaven will know each other so intimately, you'll love each other so deeply, and everything you'll experience will be even a deeper charity, a deeper delight than you ever experienced on earth with all those around you. Now sometimes people think of this idea of eternity and just think that it's endless time, like time will just go on and on and on and never end. And so Pope Benedict even refers to this saying that sometimes people have this sense of it's infinitely boring. What are we going to do for an in, in, in eternity? And so in Pope Benedict XVI in Space Salve, he says that he thinks it's easier to, to understand it like this. You jump into an ocean of joy, of delight, of love. And it's just total, you're totally immersing yourself in this. 
and the moment you enter the water, time ceases, stops to exist, and you just are there existing in this overwhelming sensation of joy and delight and happiness. It, he he kind of cautions you to not get caught up in this idea of time going on and on and on, because time will cease to exist. We just simply will be will be united to God, be united to Him in love and happiness and joy and be overwhelmed with that. And that's eternity. The other thing in heaven is that we will have glorified bodies. Those who are in heaven will have glorified bodies. And glorified bodies will be endowed with four things. Beauty and passability, agility and subtlety. And so you can think about Christ after his resurrection. Some of the things that we can see with Christ will also see a foreshadowing of our own glorified bodies. So Christ could be touched. We see St. Thomas here touching the wound on his side. We could be touched. Our bodies will be able to have the physical uh, features we have today. Um, the, the material will be able to be touched. Just like Christ could all of a sudden appear in a room with locked doors, walking through walls, we'll be able to do that. Um, Christ could be in one moment in Jerusalem and another moment in Galilee. He can move at the speed of thought. So glorified bodies, beauty. Each person in heaven with a glorified body will shine like a star. Now each will have their own distinct glory, greater or lesser splendor to, to, according to the holiness of their lives, but you won't be, there will be no envy. It will be just rejoicing in each other's beauty. You'll be inexpressibly beautiful, and every person will be such a joy and delight to each other and we'll just rejoice in our beauty. Glorified bodies will have impassibility. It means they're incapable of suffering. So there will be no sickness, no pain, no growing old, no hunger, no thirst. Never can be burned or frozen or wounded. The body will be immortal, unchangeable, perfect health, unfailing strength. Glorified bodies will have agility. This refers to traversing great distances at the speed of thought. So we don't really know what heaven will be like um, in the sense of will there be mountains or, or what, but we'll, if there were, you can move from one end of heaven to the other. Um, you can move without labor, fatigue, this idea of just moving the speed of thought. This is just an analogy to help give you a sense of what that means. But we can see it in Christ, his resurrected body, being able to move at the speed of thought, just great distances. And then glorified bodies will have subtlety, which means you could penetrate matter, so you could pass in and out of things at will. And so no, no wall will be too thick, no iron gate so massive, no mountain so great to form an obstacle. So again, you can see Christ when it, in his resurrected, glorified body passing through walls. And so um, it's taught that as the sun rays pass through glass, so the glorified bodies are in heaven. And there's also this thought that you can make yourself visible and invisible at will. Now, why we would need to necessarily be doing these things, we don't... The, the speculation really doesn't go that far, but they're just saying this is, the, this is what our glorified bodies will be like so we can get an understanding for how we will exist to that point. Now, just like in hell, the people in hell experience the pain of the senses. Those in heaven will also experience the joys of the senses. So sight... The power of sight. It'll be so perfect that nothing can hide from your eyes. You'll be able to see what is distant as well as what is close to the same, clear, with the same clarity. The smallest ob object is clear as the largest. You'll be able to gaze at the sun without flinching. And then the objects of sight. You'll have the glories of the kingdom of heaven, all the other angels and all the other saints in heaven with you. You'll be able to see their magnificence, their glory. And then you'll be able to see, see the inexpressible beauty of Jesus himself. So this is one of the joys of the senses of sight. The joys of the senses of hearing. You'll hear the canticles of the angels and then all those in heaven will join in with them. And not just in heart, but even your voices. And they'll all sound sweet, harmonious, singing praises to God. And it'll be the, the most beautiful sounds to give joy to your sense of hearing. Smell, there'll be delicious odors of paradise and it just surpasses anything man can imagine. Taste, we don't 
the, whenever you read about this, the church fathers speculate that we don't really understand exactly how this will be gratified, but there will be some sense where your sense of taste will be satisfied. Um, it won't be with ordinary food. You won't have any need to eat, but there's this s- speculation that maybe a taste of some t- something sweet always on your lips. Just to kind of emphasize that every part of your being will experience joy is what this is really emphasizing. Touch, you'll just always feel comfort and ease. You have this sense of peace throughout your entire being. Your intellect. So you'll be able to in- eternally contemplate God. There'll be no limit or defect in the knowledge you can gain. You'll be able to have a, your, a complete satisfaction of your un- understanding, your mind, your memory, your intellect. You'll be able to look at all created things and behold them in the light of God. You'll have wisdom incomparable to the wisdom of Solomon. You'll be able to understand all the powers of the universe. This is one of my favorite, but nothing will be hidden. You'll be able to understand how God's providence worked throughout your life, how God's providence worked throughout human history, throughout salvation history. You'll be able to understand how everything played together, um, that God used everything for good and to accomplish everything He wanted. You'll be able to see how God and how your guardian angels, how other people worked in your life, Um, to help you be able to get to heaven. So events of your past life will be understood and your memories will be clear and distinct. You'll see God's hand in your life and in the lives of those around you in heaven as well. You'll be able to understand how good was God was working for good in everyone's lives. And then in heaven, and I mentioned this already, but we'll have the beatific vision. This is seeing God face to face. We'll be consumed with divine charity. We will know God perfectly. He will love us perfectly and we will love Him in in return perfectly. We'll be united to Him perfectly. And then we'll see God face to face and see God as He is. We'll see His infinite glory and goodness. St. Augustine says that it's not really possible for us to totally understand what this means. But in St. Augustine's writings, he says that the best way he can try to understand this is to think about creation. And then in heaven, if we look upon creation, we'll see it with clarity. So if we were to look upon a tree, we wouldn't just see the tree and its physical features and that's it. We would see the tree, see its physical features, but also see how it fits harmoniously into all of God's plans. Why it's there, what what God's purpose was for that tree, and we'll be able to see everything in perspective of, of a whole. And so it said we'll be able to see God as he is through creation in this perfect way. But he says that we, he really couldn't go further than that. He says, I don't know what more I can say about the beatific vision. We can't even begin to conceive what that means to see God as he is. But it will be something that will be so um, completely fulfilling and satisfying. So in summary, heaven and hell exist. Let me go back to that page. So the, heaven and hell are both realities, and we have to keep them both in perspective as we live our lives each and every day. Heaven is the fulfillment of the deepest desire of man, a state of supreme, definitive happiness. The joys we have on earth will pale in comparison to the light of glory we'll experience in heaven. But then hell is the opposite of heaven. It'll be shattered dreams, total emptiness, bitterness far beyond anything experienced on earth. It'll be hope unrealized, love denied, full of selfishness and self-hate, and then just an ongoing lack of fulfillment. And, and both are the results of free choices. So we can choose to love God and cooperate with His grace or reject God and His grace. And so at the end of our earthly journey, one of these two destinies will be given to us based on God's judgment of our lives. So we should do all that we can so at the end of, end of our lives on earth, the time of our judgment, God can look to us and say, Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. <coughs> and then do all we can so we can receive the imperishable crown of eternal life. And so knowing that heaven is our goal should give us direction and every decision of our lives should be impacted by this goal. We should judge something of value by whether it draws us towards God or pulls us away from God. 
We should always want to do what it is that God desires, what it is that pleases God, and not focus on what it is that pleases me. And both love and fear can help us. You can have a love of God and a healthy fear of the alternative. And both should make a difference in how we live. So knowing God loves us and offers us eternal happiness should move us. Loving God and always wanting to do what pleases Him. And then a healthy fear of wanting to stay the course because of the alternative to heaven. And so I'll just end with this quote from Peter Kreeft. He says, If all of life's roads lead to the same place, it makes no ultimate difference what choices we make. But if they lead to opposite places, to infinite bliss or infinite misery, unimaginable glory or unimaginable tragedy, then life is a life or death affair, and our choice of roads is infinitely important. And so live every day so that you too can be a saint and keep heaven as your goal. All right, and these are some of the references. I have some of the books up here if you want to look at them. Um, and next week, I'll, I'll put on our little handout, I'll put a whole list of books and things like that so y'all can have that. Um, but any questions that you guys have? I was thinking, I always thought that you could pray for the dead and that would help them, but the Well, you can pray for the souls in purgatory. And we'll talk about that next week. But for those who have already been judged and, and sent to hell, there's no redemption for them. But part of it, we don't know. So we don't know the hearts of people. And so we should still pray for anyone that's died because we don't know their eternal destiny. Only God knows. And so we can hope that they're in purgatory or they're in heaven, but we can pray for the souls in purgatory. And we'll talk about that next week. But definitely pray for those who have died because those who are in purgatory need our prayers. What happens in heaven should you make it and all your family does it? Are you aware of that? Okay, so what happens if you're in heaven and you people in your family aren't there? You, you are aware, but what the church fathers tell us is that in heaven, there's only joy, there's no sorrow. So if there are people who you loved in this earthly life who are in hell, you're not sorrowful for that because you know it's God's justice and God's mercy playing together. So the reason you are where you are in heaven is because of God's justice and mercy and the reason they are in hell is because of God's justice and mercy. So you rejoice in God's justice and mercy. It's not that you're sorrowful. I mean you wish they were in heaven to some degree. I mean you wish they were there having that glorious encounter with Christ but you don't have this remorse or this sadness or this sorrowfulness because you see how everything worked together for good and at the end God's justice and His mercy and His love are what stands out. And so you're aware that you knew them to some degree and you, you know that they're not in heaven, but there's not this sadness within you um, that exists. The church fathers just say it's going to be so joyful. You understand. You're just at peace with everything that's happened. You understand why things are the way they are. Mm hmm. <laughs>